Have you ever wondered just how corrupt the Nazis were? We all know about the atrocities committed against innocent Jews and other minority groups, but did you know that their regime was also incredibly corrupt? From mass theft to trans-European trafficking enterprises in stolen commodities, the Nazis carried out widespread corruption. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into the disgraceful ways in which the Nazis carried out their corruption and the shocking history behind it all. The 1938 Nazi Law The Anschluss, when Nazi Germany took over Austria, happened just a few weeks before the new law went into effect. On April 26, 1938, a law from Hitler's government said that all Jewish property in Germany and Austria worth more than 5,000 Reichsmarks, about $2,000 in American money at the time, or $34,000 today, had to be registered. The registration covered movable items such as furniture and art, as well as accounts for life insurance and investments. By the end of July of that year, German financial authorities had compiled records on about 700,000 Jewish citizens of the country. These individuals held around 7 billion Reichsmarks worth of money that the government could Aryanize and steal from them. These individuals referred to this process as Aryanization. According to the historian Gotz Ali, who wrote the book Hitler's Beneficiaries, Plunder, Racial War, and the Nazi Welfare State, Aryanization was really a massive trans-European trafficking enterprise in stolen goods. As the Nazis expanded their grip over more territory in Eastern Europe, including Austria, Poland, and the remainder of Eastern Europe, the number of Jewish houses that they were able to loot increased. Prior to the edict that was issued in April 1938, Jews had been the target of hatred in Germany as well as the rest of Europe. However, according to a legal expert who worked for the Nazi Ministry of Economics, this regulation was the forerunner to a comprehensive and definitive elimination of Jews from the German economy. In other words, it was the first step toward the final solution. The Great Depression was still raging in Germany when the Enabling Act was passed, which granted Hitler and his ministers complete control over the legislative branch. Hitler committed the resources of his administration to two crucial economic policies. The development of military weaponry and autarky, sometimes known as economic self-sufficiency. He increased the need for coal produced domestically and directed resources from the government into the German military, which led to Germany's financial success under his leadership. Ali, a historian, claims that even after the economy of the country began to improve, he still required additional funding for the military. As a result, he fabricated a firm to serve as collateral for counterfeit promissory notes. In order for the government and its agencies, such as the military, to function without bringing a halt to the economy, it was necessary for them to find a mechanism to convert paper money into real money. This is where the wealth of Jewish people became relevant. Hitler's vicious anti-Semitism gave Germans a familiar foe to unify against. He promoted the idea that Jews became affluent by stealing from Aryans and blamed them for Germany's military defeat in World War I. Historian Peter Hayes, author of How Was It Possible, explains that the robbery part of Hitler's decree is embedded in this ideology that these people are parasites who attach themselves to us, and they live by sucking our blood, and we are entitled to punish them and take it all back. Also, most Germans were not Jewish, but the Nazi philosophy said that they were. After the property record was made in April 1938, Jewish residents were hit with a number of economic measures that made it harder for them to live well. Martin Thurau, a historian, talks about how middle-class families with children lost their tax breaks and had to pay the top tax rate, no matter how much money they made. After that, a number of Jewish-owned companies were falsely accused of tax fraud dating back to the 1920s and had to pay back taxes. Also, wealthy Jews had to give up half of their goods in order to leave Nazi Germany legally. Hayes says that the fact that Jewish refugees couldn't take any of their money with them made it harder for them to find a safe place. By late 1938, they were allowing Jews to keep just 8% of what their Reichsmarks were worth in the foreign nation. The Ridiculous Amount of Money Hitler Made Off Mein Kampf In 1923, Hitler was in jail for nine months for trying to bring down the German government. During that time, he wrote Mein Kampf, the book that would make him rich. 
Hitler's anti-Semitic rant didn't get Germany's attention at first, and book sales were slow. In the Smithsonian video Hitler's Riches, a researcher named Dr. Pascal Trees from the Institute for Contemporary History said, They sold okay. Trees says that the notorious leader's memoir was first released in 1924 and sold for 12 German marks. In order to sell more copies, the Nazis changed and shortened the credo. But the Third Reich was still trying to find a way to get Hitler's book into every German home. Upon Hitler's election as chancellor in 1933, the potential for increased profits from Mein Kampf became apparent. According to Dr. Chris Wetton, author of Hitler's Riches, of course there were a lot of weddings, there usually are, and then they all had to be paid for by the state. Wetton went into more detail, saying that the government had bought books of Mein Kampf to give to newlyweds. Hitler got 10% of the price of each book sold at the time it was given as a wedding gift by the state. During the height of Mein Kampf's popularity, Hitler made about $12 million a year in fees from the book's sales. By 1939, there were 5 million copies of Hitler's works out in the world, and they had been translated into 11 different languages. According to the book, Hitler's Riches, Hitler didn't have to pay the 400,000 Deutsche Marks, $120,000 in today's money, in taxes he owed as president of Germany. Wetton thought that the government might have put some pressure on Hitler before deciding that, as chancellor, he shouldn't have to pay taxes. Since 1940, the state of Bavaria has owned the rights to the Führer's statement. During that time, they have always refused to give permission for reprints, so no new copies have been made since the war ended. But now that the copyright has run out, the Institute of Contemporary History's annotated version of Hitler's Mein Kampf, which was released in Munich, is for sale for the first time. The Extensive Theft of the Nazis Julius Ringel, a high-ranking general in the German army at the time of the invasion of Greece by the Nazis in 1941, was a pivotal figure in the operation to begin unethical excavations on the island of Crete. Ringel, frequently with the assistance of his soldiers, removed the vast majority of the island's cultural artifacts because they were just lying around doing nothing. He turned some of them over to German museums as war loot and sold the others in order to make some money. Important artifacts were also stolen from the Villa Ariadne, which Ringel had transformed into the headquarters of the division. Prior to its transformation, the Villa Ariadne served as the home of the British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans. The Palace of the Minoans, which formerly stood at the archaeological site of Knossos, is believed by specialists to have been the cultural epicenter of the Minoan civilization. He stole a lot of beautiful goods from a room that was shut up there. Antiquities were lost in the islands of Crete, Macedonia, Tiryns, Asini, and Samos, according to Vasilios Petrakos, who is in charge of antiquities and is the general secretary of the Archaeological Society of Athens. According to Petrakos, the region of Thessaly in northern Greece saw a significant amount of archaeological excavation, while other regions of Greece saw German archaeologists supervise excavations of a lesser scale. Alfred Rosenberg, a prominent figure in Nazi ideology, was put in charge of organizing the archaeological excavations in Thessaly. He was the leader of the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, which was responsible for the theft of artifacts and documents all over Europe. In the months leading up to the Nazi invasion of Greece in April 1941, the nation's museums had begun stowing away priceless treasures of art and artifacts. It was necessary to conceal certain works of art in crypts, caves, or gardens so that they would not be destroyed by bombs or stolen. A few of the statues were turned on their sides and placed in ditches that were later filled with sand and sealed with cement. Petraco said that only important museums like those in Athens, Olympia, Delphi, Thessaloniki, and Chalkis really hid their riches. The smaller museums did not have good security, so a lot of antiques were stolen. Looting happened at a time when there was a lot of demand for old things. This made it harder to find stolen things, especially in Germany, Switzerland, and France. During World War II, when Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were in charge of Poland, about 500,000 items were stolen or destroyed. Not only were the Nazis war criminals, but they were also the biggest thieves. We hope you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you're a history addict, 
and please let us know about what civilization or time period we should talk about. Also, watch another video here.